Hi there. I hope you're enjoying these videos. Uh, give the subscribe button a click if you want to see more of them. So my words right now are appearing in your consciousness. If you look around you, everything you can see is also appearing in your consciousness. Everything that's ever happened to you, every experience you've ever had, every experience you ever will have, every idea, every thought, all of that appears in consciousness. Consciousness is the one thing we can know directly. Objects in the external world, we can only know them through our consciousness, through the representations we have of them. And so if we can only ever know consciousness directly, can we ever be sure that anything else actually exists outside of consciousness? You know, in the modern scientific way of looking at reality, we take matter to be fundamental, then everything else appears after that. But can we really be certain that matter is really there? How do we know that consciousness isn't primary? Well, the idea that consciousness is all that really exists is an idea in philosophy known as idealism. Now, this idea has been around for centuries. It's as old as the oldest religions in the world. And if you look at the writings of the people of the Indus River Valley, uh, who came to be known as the Hindus, based on Indus, name of the river where they lived, they had philosophical writings laying out their picture of the nature of reality, known as the Upanishads, these Hindu texts. And in the Upanishads, it's written that beyond the reality that we know, the kind of ordinary everyday reality, transcendent to that, there is this supreme self, a supreme consciousness that brings reality into existence. So this supreme self goes by the name of Brahman. And it's written that Brahman exists as this transcendent, eternal, supreme self and that Brahman came into form, became all of us, became all of the world, in order to kind of lose itself. And instead of existing for all eternity, with no structure, just unending eternal being, at some point, Brahman came into form to divide up eternity into lifetimes and to have the pleasure and joy of coming to know itself through many forms. So as I appear in your consciousness now, when you die and return to Brahman, all of these are opportunities for this one supreme consciousness to know itself. And so the ancient Greeks had a similar philosophy. And when we get up to a few hundred years ago, about 300, in the Christian tradition, in Western, Western philosophy, uh, Bishop Berkeley made this idea, uh, popularized this idea, that fundamentally everything in reality is made out of consciousness. That's what's real. This is where we get the thought experiment of the tree falling in the woods and no one being around to hear it and asking, does it make a sound? Now, when Berkeley considered what it is to be something like an apple, instead of saying the apple exists of matter and atoms, then we can perceive it. 
he argued that the apple actually is an object in our experience. The apple exists as its perceived shape, its colour, its taste, all of these sensory appearances and consciousness. That is what the apple is. And he went further than just saying that's what it is in our minds to saying that's what it really is, period. The matter of the apple doesn't exist. If no one's looking at it, it's not there. Now, this was seen as quite a radical position to take. But actually, it takes us a while when we're babies to build up a picture, not only of an external world outside of our minds, but also of the existence of other minds. We're not born with this being obvious. And so our starting point in the world really is this kind of idealism that Berkeley put forward, where there's really just mind. And then we have to kind of make these compromises and start to figure out that when certain sensory patterns occur in a certain way, that probably means that they've got a mind and it probably means that that's an apple that exists out in the world. But it's actually not really as radical as it might sound. It's radical from our perspective, from the perspective of science, to claim that only consciousness exists. But subjectively, it's the most obvious starting point. And so Berkeley's idea, this consciousness, that makes up reality. That consciousness, in the same way as is, fa is found in Hinduism, is a transcendent consciousness. A consciousness that's worthy of a word, a label, like God. It's this thing that's more than the everyday, more than this world, and it manifests this world. It comes first, and it's this pure, eternal, perfect thing that brings matter into being, manifests all these different forms. And each of us carries a spark of this divine consciousness that is our consciousness. And in this way of thinking, when we have spiritual experiences, say if we're meditating and we're identified with pure consciousness, that is felt to be, or in this perspective, it's understood to be a connecting with this divine essence that's within you. You're tracing yourself back to your source in this supreme consciousness. And so with this perspective, we actually can't disprove it. We can't deny that it could be the case. It fits with everything we ever observe because everything we ever observe appears in consciousness. And the primacy of consciousness, it fits with this picture. No matter how much science accumulates evidence of a materialist worldview, it could always be upended in a moment by the revealing of this Supreme Self. What I mean by that is, it's almost like, it's, it's the same as the argument that we could be dreaming right now. You don't know that this is not a dream. You could be dreaming, you're watching this video and then wake up and you're still you and it was a very short dream and you had a little nap and maybe you've seen some of my videos before and you imagined one while you were dreaming, but it could be more radical than that. You could suddenly wake up and remember that you're an alien living in a vast 
a, a solar system vast distances away and that all of humanity all of human history was just some strange dream you had that could happen I could wake up right now and realize that I am some strange bacteria that lives on Mars but has dreams and we can't disprove this it's really important to remember that this is always an option and it could be the case that we live in a world where the most literal truths or truth claims of one specific religion happen to be true it absolutely could be the case that there is a supreme intelligent creator who whose motives are impenetrable to us and under certain circumstances provides a revelation to individuals that is so convincing that you know these people go on to be prophets of religions they're certain they've just they've had the veil lifted they've seen behind the curtain this god has just whispered in their ear and pointed out the way it is that could be the world we live in and when we all die it could be the case that it turns out it's all some strange joke from the perspective of the scientific materialist viewpoint. Now, I am a scientist, one who is familiar with spiritual experience, but I'm still a scientist. And everything I try to do in my work like this is trying to show how those two things don't diminish each other. The scientific worldview fits with spiritual experience and doesn't diminish it. Spiritual experience doesn't become some strange hallucination and then we can just get on with normal everyday life in some drab material world. Spiritual experience can be understood to be getting closer to the nature of reality in a way that fits with science. So given everything I've said about how convincing these arguments can be, that consciousness might be primary, that we could be dreaming right now, that we could be in a simulation, that's another illustration of the same idea. Know, that we could be in some kind of matrix um, and that we might just wake up one day given how convincing all that can be why have I dedicated my career to science to a viewpoint that takes material to be foundational and just fully dismisses this perspective. Well, when I was a teenager and I was about to go to university, I had the option of choosing between philosophy or experimental psychology. Experimental psychology just means psychology where everything has to be based in data-driven experiments doesn't mean it's some kind of weird <laughs> experimental in that sense forms of psychology um, so I was interested in consciousness perception these these kinds of issues and I wasn't sure which way to go and I'm very glad that I chose experimental psychology which led me to neuroscience because with philosophy which is incredibly valuable. With philosophy though, we could spend, you could spend a lifetime arguing about whether consciousness is primary, whether reality exists at all. You know, these very foundational questions. But with science, what you do is you take a much more pragmatic approach. And with, with the scientific worldview, what happened is people 
said, well, if we assume the material world exists and we assume it's primary and we assume that we can interact with it and gather data through experiment, if we take that worldview, a worldview we can't prove, it's an assumption, but if we allow ourselves that assumption, we can see how far we get. Does it lead us to a situation where we gather so much knowledge that our assumptions seem to be borne out? They seem to make sense. And this is a situation we're in now. You know, you're watching me across space and time by this very strange thing called the internet. And the internet is made of physical stuff. We took physical matter out of the earth and arranged it in such a way as to make this. How strange is that? <laughs> How much knowledge must we have gathered about the way reality is to do this incredible trick? It's like arranging dominoes in such a way that information can be transmitted across space and time. And we build cities and we have such powerful technology that we're about to make ourselves go extinct. You know, this is the power of our knowledge that is all built in the back of this assumption that material world exists and is primary. Now, it's really important though to always remember that it's an assumption. Cultures have a habit of making these kinds of assumptions and then solidifying them into dogmas where the assumption after it's it's been in place for so long in our case a few hundred years which isn't actually that long if you think about it <laughs> but for a few hundred years this materialist game has been working very well and so we take the assumption to be true we kind of just assume at some point along the way it was proved it was never proved no one's ever proven the material world is primary and that it exists now to argue that forcefully would be to be kind of pedantic you know to look around you now at all this science and technology that permeates our lives to look at your smartphone and claim science has no evidence that materialism works it clearly works but the point is, is to keep a certain level of humility because it could always be the case that right now you'll just wake up and realize that all of this was a strange dream or that you, when you die, you'll have this feeling of returning to some immaterial world where it turns out all this technology was just some funny trick in this kind of simulation of life. It could be the case. And this is not appreciated in science. People don't like it if you say this. Um, because we're making such gains with the materialist assumption. But we must remember it's an assumption. Now, when people feel that materialism is true and they forget it's just an assumption, when people with that perspective start to think about consciousness, then we get into some strange areas because consciousness is the one remaining question that materialism has not yet solved. I think 
we will get there very soon with a picture of how consciousness emerges out of material interactions where we can understand consciousness as a phenomena in its own right and the most important phenomena from our perspective so not something that is reduced to matter and disappears but as a thing that emerges from matter but most but many materialists to be a materialist naturally if you look at the definition of it is to feel that only matter exists and so you get some materialists like the philosopher Daniel Dennett who argues that because only material exists consciousness itself far from being the only thing that we can directly know as I argued earlier he argues that consciousness is an illusion it doesn't really exist it's just a trick now a lot of people believe this but I, my feeling in the field of consciousness research is that most people are not convinced by this most people find it baffling to argue that consciousness itself could be an illusion because it's the only thing we ever know you can argue the material doesn't exist but you can't really argue that consciousness doesn't exist but he makes a good go of it uh, there's a book called consciousness explained um where he makes this case so in these videos the claims I make such as that uh, objects don't really exist in the way we think they do you know I've said many times here that if you look at an object like an apple and you perceive it to be an object in its own right and you think that exists and my laptop exists and my phone exists and these objects are what comprise reality if you think that way that's incorrect when it comes to how reality really is and we know that actually all this material stuff it's one single system that radiates out into this incredibly complex unfolding single thing and our brains notice patterns that really exist in the structure of reality and they learn to separate out different parts of this reality into concepts so you think like a mug with a handle if you say the handle of the mug that exists in your mind that's a concept but it's quite easy to see that there's no particular point where the handle emanates from the cup or the mug there's no particular point that divides the two you know the cup itself is the whole object and the handle is a smaller object and if you want to argue that handles exist foundationally and handles are real and cups are real you get into some quite strange situations of trying to make sense of you know what it is to be a cup and if you swap out all the materials and the form stays the same is that still a cup there have been many arguments made of this kind um theseus's ship is an old one from ancient greece where if you have a ship and you swap out all the boards or the planks and you swap out the hull and you change every single bit but this but the shape and the form remains the same is it still the same ship if you think ships exist then you can get confused by these kinds of kinds of arguments but if you understand that a ship or a handle or a mug is a concept in your mind you can appreciate that reality is just this single system and it does exist in a material sense is my assumption that's where I'm beginning from <laughs>
and our minds structure it into objects. So when I say that an apple doesn't really exist as an object in its own right, I'm not saying it only exists in your, in your mind. Apples do, but there is still a spherical pattern in reality. It's just not an apple because it's beyond our minds. And so if we take the tree falling in the woods and making a sound, and we have this picture in which the material world exists, but doesn't have any innate appearance, no innate qualities. But then once you get consciousness, once that emerges, consciousness is where these qualities appear and are generated by our brains. Well then, the tree falls and the tree really exists as a material thing and the floor does and the vibrations in the air that emanate, they really exist as vibrations. And then if those vibrations move an eardrum and then send electrical signals to a brain that's learnt the structure of this world, learnt what trees are, what sounds are, and then the sound appears in the consciousness associated with that brain. Well, here we have a picture that makes sense. It, the answer depends on what you, what definition you give to a sound. If you say a sound is vibration, well then the tree does make a sound when there's no one around to perceive it. But we have the word vibration for that. What sound really means most of the time when people use it is the perception of a sound. So actually, Berkeley would argue the tree falling in the woods with no one around to hear it, it doesn't make a sound because the tree doesn't exist when no one's around to perceive it. I would also argue it doesn't make a sound, but that the tree does exist. The tree falls, it makes vibrations, which is something Berkeley wouldn't think would happen, but that it does take consciousness for this sound to appear in, for the sound to exist. Thanks for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you want to see more of these videos.